You meet someone online, there's a connection. You talk, and after some time, you're ready to meet in person. You get ready for your date, you're excited, you're nervous. You head to your meeting point, and then you're beaten, threatened, harassed. The people whose stories we're going to listen to today experience the heartbreaking situation known as Quito. False dates set up by swindlers for the purpose of entrapping or harming LGBT people. To respect their privacy, we're going to conceal their identities. My name is Ari Toko, and you're watching Untold Facts. In 2018, there were over 200 reported hate crimes against LGBT people in Nigeria. Now, these were crimes carried out by fellow citizens, individuals who felt empowered to carry out acts of hate against another human being simply because of their sexuality. They came down from the bus with guns, and they had their uniform. So they asked me to bring out my ID card, which I did. And one of them said, I was looking like a lady in my ID card. I didn't remember to be scared. I just pictured the end. I tried to imagine how this tragedy was already going to play out. So the boy was trying to escape, but it was too late. They dragged him back, they started beating him, everything. At the end of the day, I don't know where they take him to. Now there's certain fundamental rights that every Nigerian citizen is entitled to the right to privacy, the right to life, the right to freedom of association and assembly, actually hold that. Because LGBT people in Nigeria have that last right, the right of freedom to assembly and association, severely limited. Is there ways in which we use legal structures and violence and oppression to determine someone's ability to live fully? I think this is why we're here, to yes. increase people's knowledge of their rights. So I'm very happy to know that the statistics, the data is showing that perceptions are changing, that people are becoming more aware of the real life implications of these laws. Because I think when people don't understand that these laws affect people on a day-to-day -day basis, then they're less likely to care. So I'm really happy. Change is coming. It's slow. It's, it's taking a while, but it will surely, surely, surely come. None of us is free until all of us are free. This is how we can have a more inclusive and a more diverse society. My name is Ari Toko. Thank you for watching. How many times in total have you been ketoed? Four times. Four times. And uh, which one would you like to talk about? One that each time I remember about this particular one, it always takes me back to the past. Can you tell me about it? Okay. I've been chatting with this guy for a while. He said he stays around so very low and soon. So on that faithful day, I I told him I was coming closer to Law and to pick up a cake. If you can sit there, it will be fine. And he was not picking up. So on the Sunday afternoon, he was like, he came around first time in the hotel, if I can come there. I said no. He disturbed me from the morning till 2 p.m. Then he asked for my address. Then I gave him the address to my bus stop. When he got to the bus stop, he called. I said, okay, he should come over. And he came down to the house. But entering my gate, he was so scared because I can't be ketoed in my own house. And I'm not this kind of a dull, scared person. So he was like, we should look for a bar to hang out outside the street. I said, since there is light, if he's not okay in the apartment, he can leave. Then he waited for a while, then he came in again, he started talking. Then I noticed all those while we were talking, he was chatting with his iPhone, he was sending messages. And after everything, he told me, he, there's a card they sent for him, about 20,000 hour card. If I can buy, he wanted to know if there's money in the house. If I can buy the card, then I said, I'm not interested. At this time, what was going through your mind? Nothing. So, because looking at the body of the guy, I'm not, he can't beat me one-on-one. -on -one. So, 
we had we did something we played together then i was set to go to work and he came out i locked the door we took bike down to the bus stop and i was having this bag that has my phones and everything then to the bus stop i wanted to come down because he was at my back then he was holding that bag that was where I noticed something is wrong. Mm. And later I told him to come down so I can pay for the bike. He said, no, I should respect myself. I demanded that on that bike, I should respect myself. I laughed. I told the bike where he, can, he would drop. The bike dropped. He came down. So immediately the bike was, dropped, was standing opposite the hotel where I work. So immediately the bike stopped. I paid the bike. He was looking somewhere as I crossed immediately. He followed me. I ran inside the hotel. He followed me with immediate effect. He was pursuing me. I jumped a building. I injured one. I broke one of my leg. Then I never knew on his way coming out, he met with the security guys. All this out, they collide with them. They told him, because I run a business outside that hotel, they told him the time to come and meet me. Okay. Then in the evening, he came back on a shot. Started telling me, uh, have I won't finish? <laughs> I looked at the guy. Then he said I should give him the money I'm owing him. That he borrowed me money to start business. I should give him the money back. I was like, Do you know me from Adams? And immediately I never I noticed all those stuff. They just gathered at the corner. They were they were watching the next reaction. So immediately I removed the bag, my phones, the money, everything. I gave it to one of my boy i said hold this bag he just put hand to drag the bag i removed the hand those were like what happened what happened people should come this side we went there so they now took him inside one compound he narrated everything they called me that if i'm aware of the accusation the guy is saying i said what's the accusation he said i'm a gay i said really they say yes i said this is the first time i'm seeing this guy i didn't even know him from adams the matter I asked for my phone to call the police people, they seized the two phones. They I immediately they asked us to sit on the floor. We're sitting on the floor. All these stuff, they were much more than they are not more than more than fifty. They surrendered the gate, many of them. And initially I hear you by speak also. So they were saying, ah you, this one. They removed the clothes. So he was saying that we had sex, he fucked me twice, blah blah blah. I said, ah. Can you go to a shrine to swear? Do you know me before? So from there, the matter was, I noticed the matter was becoming so serious. Mm -hmm. They started beating, different slaps. If you look, slap, this one, ah. So at that minute, they were like, they've been suspecting me, no wonder, there's like a lot of talks. Mm -hmm. I was still there. And they asked me to pay, they asked him for some money. He was not exceptional. That's the most funniest part of the who any beating I'm receiving is even receiving ten times of my own. Mm. So they beat him very well. They asked for my they asked me to drop hundred thousand uh, I noticed if I should drop any money at that time, mm. it would be coming for more money. Due to me I'm close to them. Ah, different crowd down like the whole street, the hotels, people, the whole of my business, they were eating on credits, everything. The noise. So the boy was trying to escape, but it was too late. They dragged him back, they started beating him, everything. At the end of the day, I don't know where they take him to. Mm -hmm. So they came back, they asked, how much can I give them? I told them I was having about 60,000 in the house. At that night, they said, okay, they bought a bike. This one said, enter. They followed me down to the house. Maybe they opened the door. They opened the fridge, this one, they bought our wines, everything. They checked the television. This one said they wanted to carry the, the screen television. This one said no, they they taken out chains, watch, socket. So from there, they asked for my ATM at that spot. So they say, okay, they, I, they collected the money in cash. Mm -hmm. Then they asked me to follow them back. I said, no, because of the legs, so I need to relax. Mm -hmm. As early as five, two came back again on bike. They said I should follow them. I followed them. They took me back to the bank. They said I should put my ATM and withdraw, balance them so they can release that guy. <laughs> I put the ATM. I had to start pressing the ATM hand. 
They say I know what I'm doing, which bank I say access bank, I say okay, they took me to access bank. I had to wait till the bank opens. Mm -hmm. Then they were holding my big phone with the small phone. So immediately I told them to give me the small phone. Let me do some little one of them said give him, they gave me. So immediately I was sending message to my uncle is a policeman. Yes. And he was asking me to chill that if they should come and pick them up, I said no. Since the bank has camera, they should follow me inside the bank. So we went inside the bank. I wrote this in the security man, they were looking at me, asking questions. I was just trying to ignore some talk. I had so to the write, policemen, yeah. the security were aware that yeah. something was wrong. So they asked me to give them more money to collect my phone, about 20,000 on top. I wrote the teller, I withdrew, I gave them, because they gave me the two phone. They left. They told me they are going to cover the whole scene. Nobody will know where I'm doing business, manager. I was in the house sleeping when some calls, people, the manager was like, I should come to the hotel. This, uh, when I got to the hotel, the same people that collected money, a lot of talk, I was like, ah, this, this thing a uh, scam. They want to open office on my head. Oh. I called my uncle. He was calling those people to tell them how much they want this one, but they were trying to play smart. Mm -hmm. And my uncle asked me to go to the nearest police station. They asked me on who to see. I went down to the OC crime. The man came out after everything. They bought out their vehicle. They, they, they went. They asked me to wait. Before you know, the head of the OPC guy, they brought him in. It was at the counter, they called me, I came out, they said, do you know this guy? I said, yes. He was saying rubbish. He go, they fuck me, I did that. And I looked at him, I said, okay. Since there is no evidence, when you get to court, you bring your evidence. He said, they caught me red and dead. I said, okay, no problem. We waited. In the evening, the police people came out again to raid that place. Everywhere was quiet. It's not, it was not a small issue anyway. So the, the case started. Other ones started running. They who heard about two. Their wife started begging. How and they asked long everything. Did the entire case. It was running yes. close to two weeks. Wow. They locked them up for about four, four days. Then they they collected the family brought out my money back, each of them. Then they had to pay themselves about close to for twenty thousand dollars each. Because they were begging for the matter to die in that, mm. not to go to court. Because the criminal case, not even the, the part where they are mine, not the homosexual case again. Because it's now About a the robbery, they went to the them. house and everything. The items, they bought the items, everything. So they started begging with the manager. So just to make peace because of where I do business. Yes, yes. So after everything, they paid the ransom. The, the many ones they could not afford, I had to leave them yeah. to go with it. You still live in that neighborhood? Yes, and I still sell in that place. So mostly they see me when they come out. Most of them just like, they know what he does. Blah, blah, blah. But I'm this kind of person I overlook. I'm not this kind of person that listens to talk. How do you feel when you see, when you see these people? The expense is so, so bad. I've been planning to pack away from that house. But I can't, because of the business issue, yeah. I had to just endure and face anything that comes my way. But I've been trying to, I also pray for them not to. But since it's something that is almost, it's an issue that is open, that means most people, they gossip, they can talk for Africa about your issue. I started to just take any word that comes out from them. Then I went for some lectures at Atlant, then the advice, and so I was taking some advice how to look over some issue, go on with my life. And I decided to go on with my life and think now they just greet me, they come closer, they even beg for me mostly. Like, Are you afraid that it might happen again? I'm not really afraid it might happen again because now I'm almost, I'm always careful. Mm. I don't bring people to my house. I chat less. If I don't know you before, I don't do it. I don't invite. I had to stick with my old friends. Yeah. So I don't think I can be kidded again.
the people that attacked you that day, the people who beat you and who, who robbed you, you knew them. These, did you interact with them before this incident? Yeah, we did. We did I set up for business, we talked to play, and sell food for them on credit without them paying. But I had to just look at the fact that that's life. How did you feel that these people that you have fed on credit, people you know, people you interact with, in that moment, what did that feel like? A lot of things, it was not an easy tax anyway, because a lot of, of things, that was the last thing I was thinking at that moment. The shame of, and I was even planning not to go back to that place. But I was looking at it that no, I need to go out. Because if I should stay in the house for more than two days, three days, people will feel it's right. But since the case, I'm, we, I'm on the winning side, I need to come out so they will be seeing me and to prove if what is really happening, what they are seeing, if it's true. But I was trying to prove to them the guy came. Uh, he borrowed me money for business, and later he was turning me to an homosexual. Where does that happen? Yes. So that was why I had, where I had my own stand to just, I don't know him from Adams and anywhere. It was a setup. Maybe they felt I was doing well. They planned to, so people believed that. So daily I had to come out and overdo their talks. Yeah. It was important for you that they understand that you were not afraid, and that you were going to to push back as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for for sharing this. Four times. This is Four this was times. I'm so sorry, you know, that you've had to fight for your life and fight for your livelihood and fight for your rights to walk down your own streets. And I am so humbled and so awed by your courage and your bravery because I know it took a lot from you. Thank you. Okay, so I was on my way to work. Um, it was on a Monday. I took a bus from my house and then when I got to Ojota, I had one 1,000 Naira notes with me. I needed um, like um, smaller notes to board the bus to the next bus stop. So I was buying something at the bus stop and then someone walked up to me and asked me to introduce myself to him. So I asked who he is, he said he's a policeman. He wasn't wearing uniform, so I requested for his ID card. He flashed something on my face and asked me to follow him to a bus that was parked beside the road. So I followed him to the bus and I saw some men, they came down from the bus with guns and they had their uniform. So they asked me to bring out my ID card, which I did. And one of them said, I was looking like a lady in my ID card. So, and then he complained about my hair and asked me to enter the bus. So they took me um, all the way from Ojota to Ketu. I had to call my sister to tell her what had happened. So she said I should ask them where they are taking me to. They refused to talk to her on phone. So one of the policemen asked for my phone and asked me to unlock my phone. So I did, I gave him the phone, I gave him my iPad. He went through it and then gave them back to me. And then he said, they are taking me to the station that I look like an homosexual. So they took a turn under the bridge at um, K2 and then drove me all the way to Sabo and I was locked up. So they asked me to give them money. I told them I don't have cash with me, that I needed to call someone because truly what I had was not enough for what they were asking me for. So all the while my client was calling and all that. So I requested for, um, I had two phones with me. One of the phones was couldn't browse. The other one is a camera phone. So I requested for the one that has camera on it. 
I said, I don't have air time on the small one. So they gave it to me. So what I did was I made a video of all the policemen on, at the station and the one that arrested me at the bus stop. And they kept shouting, he's gay, he's homosexual and all that, that I'm going to prison he's <laughs> for 10 years. And one of them kept saying I look like I had HIV, you know. I've never been so insulted like that in my life. So I called my uncle to help. So they told him on phone that they, they arrested me for being gay. And also, I look like a court member. <laughs> so he, he came to the station and he said he did not have enough cash, the one they are requesting for. So I asked one of the policemen if I could do transfer to him. Of course, they will not take transfer. So he said I must be stupid for asking him for his account number and all that. So I was kept in the station for like eight hours. And then eventually they took peanuts. They took what I had on me. And then they let me go, you know. And after that, I have a few friends that are bloggers. I gave them the content because one of them was really mad. And the story, by the time I woke up the next day, everybody just started calling, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And I was scared for myself, actually, because I'm, I'm not ready. I wasn't ready for such publicity, mm -hmm. you know. And that was the way it went. Before I knew it, major blogs in Nigeria had picked it. And I got calls from newspapers and TV stations and radio stations. And a lot of um, legal practitioners wanted to help out but most of all I was I couldn't go out for like days I, I was in the house for four days M most especially because of the way I was treated I followed them because I didn't want them to eat me because I've heard stories about policemen beating up people so I just followed but it's not a very pleasant experience at all I, I can totally imagine how has your sense of security been affected since that incident? Oh wow. I I have to act more manly because you know um, and I had a lot of people watching. Um, I can remember my mom begging me to cut my hair at that time, you know. So most of the time I'm not free when I'm outside. A, a lot of people are now watching to see, okay, maybe there's a sense of truth in what they are saying, you get, so, and I don't really speak with people so much when I'm outside, especially when I'm with my colleagues, because I don't want to um, raise an alarm, okay, maybe what they arrested him for is true after all. So it's been like a lonely place, actually, and that's just what I can say. It's been a lonely place. I've, I've, I just stay on my own most of the time, and I can't even relate to my family members. I can remember they had a function in the family that I wasn't invited for mm. because of that story, you know. The person was really particular in dealing with me. So I've adjusted to it, actually. So it's Is there anything at this point now you're like, oh, I should have responded differently or I should have? you know, dealt with this differently? Okay, well, before now, I've had an issue with the police, actually. You know, they, I was arrested just the same way, but that time, um, I had, I didn't have information. You know, they went through my, they asked me to unlock my phone. Of course, I have chats and pictures, so they collected money. I had to sort myself out at that point because there was no way I could tell anybody what was going on. So I was more prepared for anything that would come up. So this time around, I don't keep chat on my phone. And I, I, got, I got a phone that is like a dual phone. I could change users. So when I'm in public, I just change the user too. So if you don't have that kind of device, you won't know what. And then if you want me to switch my users, then there will be a bit of an issue. So I was more alert when I'm in public, and then responding is like, I keep calm, because even after that, I've been stopped by policemen a couple of times, but I notice that when you're calm, they, they tend to treat you well, sort of. And if um, 
you were to give some tips to anyone who, you know, might find themselves in, in that kind of unfortunate situation, what would you advise? Okay, first of all, because of the society we are in, um, we are not accepted. Do not keep chats on your phone, actually. It sounds like, okay, it's my device after all, but because of the situation, because that's the first thing they are going to go for. And then secondly, even if you must keep chat on your phone, make sure that your phone is locked. So at least if they want you to unlock your phone, you will get to the station first. And then you can get a lawyer and all that before you even unlock your phone. Then stay calm, basically. Stay calm and then um, what I've learned in my own situation is always tell people where you're going to, you know, because I notice a lot of people like to hide. I have friends that I can confide in when I'm going to see somebody. I send the person's address and phone number. If I don't call you by so so time, please start calling the person you get. So don't be too secretive. Have someone you can confide in, basically. So you'll be fine. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you so much. Can you tell me how everything started? Okay, it started on Facebook. I met this person in 2016, around August 2016. So October 2016, I came to Lagos after a harrowing experience uh, in the north during NYC. So when I arrived in Lagos, she was clamoring for the hangout. I was in a relationship, so it was not going to be a romantic hangout. It was supposed to be just movies and drinks, and that's real. So that particular day, I left my place and headed to Yaba. We were supposed to meet at her place, and then we we'll go to Ozone Cinemas. I went into the bank. I withdrew 15,000 naira and my backpack. I made my way to Yaba. I got there oh, before I left. Before I left home, I called her. I told her my battery was flat. I was not going to. It was not going. My phone was not going to be on. So because I told her my battery was flat, she just assumed maybe I was not coming with my phone or something. I told her I wrote down her phone number and her address on a piece of paper, and then I made my way to Yaba. When I got to her street, I found somewhere to charge my phone. I paid them, they gave me a key card and a key. If I could produce the card, I'd get my phone. So I found somewhere else to make a phone call close to her guest house. I didn't know it was a guest house, I thought it was her place. So it was when I got there, I realized it was a guest house. So when I got there, I made the phone call. I was about to tell her I was charging my phone somewhere close by, but she was too excited to listen. And when she came out, she was, she was, she was all over me, and I was wondering how we were just friends, and um, but anyway, we went inside. As she, she pushed me inside and locked the door. Mm. That was At the that last point, time. What was going through your mind? Nothing. What did you think was going to happen? Nothing, nothing. I didn't think it was anything, but I just heard the door lock. I was not like, why is this door locked? And then suddenly, three guys came out from the bathroom. And there where I was standing, I was looking at the locked door. I knew this door was locked and I could not escape. And they were there looking at me. They were kind of far away from me. What was going through your mind? I didn't remember to be scared. I just pictured the end. I tried to imagine how this tragedy was already going to play out. So in my mind, I wanted to, I just wanted the day to end and the next day, me telling people about this experience. But there where I was standing, I was wondering, OK, I can't get pregnant because of my androgens. Then I was 25 years old. I already know I could not get pregnant. I was, cons I was considering the STDs and the injuries they were going to inflict on me. Because this, this is normal. I've heard stories like this. And then it was hard to see myself in that situation. So instead of being scared, I was I was really calm. I said, maybe if I cooperate with them, they would, re they would be gentle. And then someone just looked at me and said, oh, so you are a lesbian? I'm not wondering, but what kind of answer will I give this person? 
that will make them comfortable. I didn't say anything. The other one now said, uh, so boys know they sweet you. I wanted to laugh, but I was, I was getting scared. The last one removed his belt, and that was when I panicked. So when, when he removed his belt, he brought out his camera phone, and they were coming towards me. I, I was really panicked. I was wondering, OK, um, this injury is probably going to be light. And since I'd never, I've never been with a man, it's probably going to be painful. And I was trying to imagine every worst thing that could possibly happen. So when they got close to me, the other one was angry. He said, why, why are you behaving like a tough girl? So you want to tell me you're a man, you're strong. He was trying to say something else when I just heard this dirty slap on my face. So I was there holding the hottest face I've ever held because my ear was still ringing and it was, that slap destabilized me. <laughs> so um, I was trying not to cry. I said, okay, this will not make me cry. Let me just toughen up and do whatever they say they want. Well, they asked me to sit down on the bed. I did. Then they asked me to strip. And I, I'm not the kind that usually wore a bra then. So I, I removed my shirt, the first one, the sweater, and then I removed my t-shirt and I was topless. The other guy removed his camera phone and was filming. So I, because of that slap, I started crying. And then I was naked again. I felt very, very vulnerable. The other one now said, oh, that, that I should not be afraid. They are spirit-filled guys. They are, they are here to do the Lord's bidding, and they want to lead me into the light. I was, as, as an atheist, I was like a um, typical Christian. I am to do the Lord's job for him. I said, OK. And now said, uh, tell me about your parents. And I'm like, they said, where is your parents? I said, OK, uh, sir, they are senior citizens, and they live in the rural area in the village. And I said, oh, then I'm still trying to speak English. The other one, not. somebody slapped me. That is what I just know. Yes, yeah, somebody slapped me. So they, they were saying, oh, I'm an elite. OK, then why am I looking like a teenage boy? Because I had my small afro then. Why am I looking like a teenage boy? I didn't know what to answer. I didn't know if my answer was going to offend them, so mm -hmm. I kept quiet again. They took my backpack. They ransacked everything. They took the 14K plus that was there. They took my, there's this other t-shirt. I like to carry extra shirt. They took my t-shirt. In fact, they took the whole bag mm -hmm. and dropped my key. They gave, they gave me my key. They took the whole backpack. They said I should be happy. I, they should ca I should count myself lucky that um, they are, they are, they are, they are Sons, good, they are good people. They describe themselves as good people who, who are not here to harm me or something. So they were still doing that when one asked where my phone is. I said I didn't come with the phone. It angered him. He took that belt on the ground and started flogging me. The other two, they were looking at him. He flogged me for a whole five minutes. So I had welts because I was naked. I had welts on my body and I was crying, I was screaming. Nobody, I, I thought it was a guest house. It looked like a guest house. So nobody came out to, even the door. I, I, I think the girl was outside the door. I said she had I did, left. I, I, I don't know. I mean, that was the last time I saw her. So um, after they, they were flogging me, I asked them to ask the girl that I told her I was not coming with the phone. One person took his phone and started texting. Apparently, the girl corroborated his, my claim and said, OK, she probably was not with the phone. That's when they asked me to wear my clothes back. I did. They gave me 600 naira for my money. And guess what? They gave me a white handkerchief. They gave me a bottle of Goya olive oil. Olive oil, yes. And they gave me um, that pocket New Testament Bible. They said I should find a spirit-filled Bible-believing church to go to attend and um, I should always attend deliverance services. That as I'm stepping out of here, that they have my nude videos. If I involve the police or tell anybody that about their whereabouts, they are going to release it on Facebook. So I didn't know what was happening. It, everything happened so fast. So I, when they pushed me outside, I, I was even still naked. So I had to wear my clothes. 
and started running. I forgot my phone. I was running. I forgot to cry. I was just running. I took the first keke I saw and was going. I had gone a considerable distance when I remembered my phone. Because that phone then was not cheap. So I, I got down from the keke. I was wondering, should I go back to that place, that particular street? And run that risk. Yes. Run the risk of meeting them. And then I said, okay, if they didn't uh, recognize the key card that I was ho or holding, it probably means they don't live in that area. So I was wondering, do I go back or do I just go home? And I had this dirty migraine that was a reminder of what I just escaped. I stayed there for a while. I started crying. People would ask, what is wrong with you? I said, nothing, nothing is happening. And then there was blood in my ear coming out from where the, I don't know, she had one of those pins, either the slaps or the belts. And, and um, I took back a keke. I went back to the phone guy. He gave me my phone. That was when I was collecting my phone and I started crying. I could not move again. I could not, I could not run, but I, I know I needed to leave that environment. So I, I held a keke and went home. I didn't mention this to anybody at all. I didn't say a word. But when I went home, it was like all is well in the world. Not like nothing happened. The person I was living with didn't even know that something it's happened. Something to me. so traumatic. So I, I blanked everything out. It took me a whole year for me to tell two people. The first person I told asked, uh, Are you sure it's not? It's not, you didn't go there to get some. I said, is that the important question? I was beaten, I was robbed, I was violated. And of all the questions to ask, are you okay, it was not part of them. You asked me if I, I, I didn't go there for, with an ulterior motive. I told the other person, the, uh, the other person said, I should be thankful I was not raped. I was not like, okay, so I am lucky I was not raped, but I, I, I'm lucky I was beaten. I was filmed. I'm lucky I was stripped naked. That is, is that it? She could not answer me. Well, I cut off ties with two of them. I never spoke to them anymore. But then, apart from those two times, I've never been able to tell anybody this happened to me. I would say I know people this happened to, but when they ask who exactly are they, I can't say I'm the one. Yes. So, except now, I feel like I'm in a good place to... How does it feel now, talking about it? I, I still feel like, even now as I was talking, I felt that migraine, that slap that I get. That I don't think I've ever been slapped like that. Although I was beaten up in duty, I was beaten up in school, all for the same reasons, for my perceived sexuality. So, but that one was very difficult because I was filmed, I think it was that camera that was facing me, that made everything different from the rest. But now I, I feel like I can talk about it and I've healed and I've moved on from it. How do you feel this experience changed you? How well, has it affected you? Um, when I got home that day, after that, um, that incident, I deactivated my Facebook account because they promised to upload my videos online and I had a little bit of repetition. I was hoping they would not go through with their threat. So I deactivated due to fear. I, I left Facebook for a while and I could not sleep. I was looking over my shoulder. I was, I was living in fear because the thought of my nudes in public was something I've never experienced before. So. I could not relate with people, I could not go out, I could not go see anybody. So I was practically at home every day crying. Or my, my anxiety level, it plummeted and I, I, I don't know how I managed. But after a few weeks, I came back online hoping someone will say something. In fact, I was looking for someone to say that they've seen my video somewhere or... But it didn't happen anyway. After a while, I just, I moved on. Thank you so much. Um, 
There are no words to describe how this must possibly have felt. And I just want to say that I'm sorry it happened. And to thank you for the bravery and courage it has taken to sit down and share and go back and share this, you know, after being unable to speak about it for so long. Thank you. In light of the stories that we have just heard, we thought it would be a great idea to share some tips that might guide with ensuring that people are as safe as they can possibly be. So we invited security consultant, Sufina Kyo Lawson, to share some advice and guidance for us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So uh, based on what the stories have heard, very like some of them quite traumatic, some very personal and quite touchy as well. So we have, I know some of them actually shared like what the lessons they learned and things they probably start doing now that they were not doing before. So things like not meeting people in a secluded place, for instance. You know, let's, let's actually even start with online. What are some things to do online, okay. even just before you, you meet in person? Okay, so first thing is you like, don't want to use your real name for starters. You want to have like a pseudonym or an alias that you could use when you're mm -hmm. chatting with somebody for the first time. You don't want to like give away too many sensitive information like let's say your, where you normally stay, your neighborhood or people who are close to you, your parents name or your siblings or how many siblings you have. Mm -hmm. You also want to like check the image that the person is sending to you. Somebody can go ahead and like just download images from Google and like share or you go to Instagram, somebody's Instagram profile and like share 10 other images. But if you go to like there's teami.com and there's like Google Images that lets you upload those same images to check if it's a fake profile or if it's not. So if I assume I get your profile I read and I upload the image, I'll know where those websites, this kind of website that have all those images has been used. So you probably get like 1,000 websites that have I read photos and you know that all oh, this is a coin. This doesn't like coincide with the same profile you've told me that you are. You told me, oh, and my yeah. name is Jane. When I upload those images, I see Arit. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense. So copy the picture onto yeah. Google Images. Copy it to Google Images or teenai.com. So that's like, like a web application that you could use. So you also want to make sure that when you're like meeting the person for the first time, you want to get a specific address of where you're going to. So sometimes the, before the skito stories come out, they tell you, oh, let's meet at a particular bus stop. They don't tell you like, oh, let's go to a particular location. Oh, this is my house address. Because they don't want you to like know where you're going to exactly. They tell you, oh, yeah, get a bike, go here, and we'll come and pick you up. A lot of the stories as how it takes it takes place. Or it, they'll tell you, oh, OK, uh, my brother will come and pick you up from the bus stop, or my sister will come and pick you up. But you don't want to like know, you want to exactly know where you're going to. So you can as well tell your friend, oh, I'm going to this particular place. If I don't, if you don't hear back from me, like one or two hours, know that something is wrong and you can get help. And yeah, that's for online. So for offline, there are cases where you like get apprehended by the police and stuff like that. You want to ensure that you don't have incriminating images on your phone. So you want to delete your chat history. You want to ensure that your phone is being locked, not just like the whole pattern or password thing. You want to have like a full proper encryption. So even before your phone boots up to show your Apple logo or your Android device logo, there's a password already that you need to, you need to impute before it gets to that stage. You also want to have like a gallery and um, what they call it app lock. So mm -hmm. for all your confidential images, your photos, your videos and every other thing you need that it needs to be protected, you want to have an app lock for that as well. So yeah, I think those are some like basic things you could use. So it also, also, when you get apprehended by a police officer, you want to like make sure you get the person's name. Somebody share that tip once in a while. Make sure you call the, the police officer. They, they normally have it on the badge. So if, like, let's say I know your name is Mr. Mohammed Adu or something like that. But if you like, make sure you re re rename the person's name and say, oh yeah, Mr. This, that they know that you've called them by their name. So they might not be able to like hold anything against you. And you want to stay calm, be confident, tell them you know your rights. You want to ask for a lawyer before you like get access to my phone and Things like that, yeah. Um, some of, a lot of the stories also have to do with financial extortion, you know. How, you said, okay, don't go somewhere, like to someone's house, go to a public place. What about with money? What's, how can you, do you not carry any money? Do you? Well, you don't, first all, you don't take too much money on you. So if you're going to meet somebody for the first time, you don't have like 50,000 or 100,000, money that you cannot pass with on a normal day or it will make you get stranded. You don't want to have like, you have three ATM cards or four ATM cards. You don't want to carry all of them at the same time. You just want to have like one, and that one should have like cash that you're, you're willing to pass with. If somebody should say, oh, let's go to the ATM now and make withdrawals. You also want to make sure that, 
let's say for instance you you don't have like an, an online banking app maybe for just for safety purposes you want to delete that app so if, if you tell oh i don't have online banking i can't do transfers you don't want to use any sms like ussd banking so you want to like tell them there are no options for that you have not enrolled for that yet and this is the amount of money you have that, that you, you're able to buy me ten thousand euro. you don't want to have flashy things like jewelries or these are like Told them that oh yes, this fan, this person actually boxed up and has money enough to give away all flashy phones. You know, if you're inviting them to your room, if you say oh I'm more comfortable in my house, don't have all the flashy things lying around, gadgets lying around, because you're just giving them the whole idea that oh this person is actually rich, rich. He can, he might want to spend more money on me. So put those items away. If it's for the first time, you might want to stock them into your room while you're whole having your phone and everything. And when the person is gone, you bring those items out again, and then you're gone. That's all. Um, what about letting uh, friends know how that, I know, you know, we talk a little bit about let somebody know. Can you expand on some ways we can do that? Okay, so um, I know WhatsApp has this feature where you have like, um, what they call it, share life location. So if you're having it, you have a best friend or it's somebody you like a close ally or something, you can, and you're not sure where you're going to for the first time, you could share your life location with that person. So what it does is that once you go to the chat, you open your location settings, it's start and you put on start, it automatically starts streaming where you are currently to the, the time you click on stop. So if you wanted to share live location for an hour or two hours or for the duration of the time your trip is going to be, you can leave it on for that. And when you're safe and when you're comfortable with where you are, and the person as well who is on the chat knows that, oh, this is where you are currently and they can make, if anything should go wrong, they know that this is where he was last seen or she was last seen and they can get a police officer to like investigate from that location and yeah. There's also Find My Friends, that's available on I think app Apple and um, what they call it, Android store as well. So you can use all those options. All right. And let's say there is a situation and this person has no one to call. Can they call tears? Yeah, they have. We have toll free lines. So zero seven zero zero call tears. And zero seven zero zero call, call tears. tears. Right. And then the other, like just you can just send us a message as well on our what they call it, social media platforms, and somebody will definitely pick it up from there. Thank you so much, Sophie. And I, again, it's really heartbreaking that I we am. have to Absolutely. discuss these strategies for something that really should be as easy and enjoyable as getting to meet and know someone. We would like to thank the individuals who shared their stories so bravely. It was not easy. And we're very grateful that they gave us their trust and that they shared their stories with us. My name is Ari Topo. Thank you for watching. In 2018, there were over 200 reported hate crimes against LGBT people in Nigeria. Now, these were crimes carried out by fellow citizens, individuals who felt empowered to carry out acts of hate against another human being simply because of their sexuality. They came down from the bus with guns and they had their uniform. So they asked me to bring out my ID card, which I did. And one of them said, I was looking like a lady in my ID card. I didn't remember to be scared. I just pictured the end. I tried to imagine how this tragedy was already going to play out. So the boy was trying to escape, but it was too late. They dragged him back, they started beating him, everything. At the end of the day, I don't know where they take him to. Now, there's certain fundamental rights that every Nigerian citizen is entitled to. The right to privacy, the right to life, the right to freedom of association and assembly actually hold that because LGBT people in Nigeria have that last right, the right of freedom to assembly and association severely limited. Is there ways in which we use legal structures mm -hmm. and violence and oppression to determine someone's ability to live fully? I think this is why we're here, to yes. increase people's knowledge of yes. their rights. So I'm very happy to know that the statistics, the data is showing that perceptions are changing, that people are becoming more aware of the real life implications of these laws. Because I think when people don't understand that these laws affect people on a day-to-day -day basis, then they're less likely to care. So I'm really happy. Change is coming. It's slow. It's, it's taking a while, but it will surely, surely, surely come. None of us is free until all of us are free. This is how we can have a more inclusive and a more diverse society. My name is Ari Topo. Thank you for watching.